Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Welcome to Mountain West AETC ECHO. Happy Thursday. I am going to talk about the update to the Department of Health and Human Services Adult and Adolescent HIV Treatment Guidelines. This update focuses on statins for primary prevention for persons with HIV. The update came in February. This got delayed a bit. Sorry about that. I tried to do it closer to the guidelines release, but that didn't happen. But now I think that's actually a bit advantageous because I can ask you what you've been doing in your clinic, how you've been integrating these guidelines. I can share a bit about my experience, and I would love to learn from you about this and hear your opinions. So please don't be shy. I don't have any conflicts or interest to disclose. This is our disclaimer from Ursa, our funder. And I'd like to start with a case, real case from my clinic. No, no poll question here. I just want you to think about it, I'm trying to get the wheels turning a bit. 50 year old patient. HIV is well-controlled, long-term viral suppression on Bactegravir TAP FTC, really no other meds. You can see there, no major cardiometabolic comorbidities, no tobacco use. You plug into the ASCBD risk estimator and the 10-year estimated risk is 3.7%. So just food for thought, how would you counsel about pros and cons of, stat, of a statin? How strongly would you encourage a statin, what other factors might you consider when counseling this person about whether they should add a statin pill to their medications? So we'll come back to this towards the end. I will say since the reprieve trial data was released, since the new guidelines were released, I think my counseling has shifted a bit and I'm thinking about this a bit differently, but again, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you to David Spock for sharing some slides that he developed. I think this is a really key one. So I'll start with this. This is the crux of the new guidelines recommendation. So for individuals with HIV who have low to intermediate, defined as less than 20% estimated 10-year ASCVD risk, and who are ages 40 to 75, this right here highlighted in yellow is the really key new recommendation. If the estimated 10-year risk is between 5 and 20%, there is an A1 level recommendation to start at least a moderate intensity statin. So A1 means a strong recommendation with high quality evidence here from the randomized control trial reprieve, which we've talked about before, and I'll summarize a bit in an upcoming slide. So this really is a, the panel recommends at least moderate intensity statin. A1 recommendation if 10-year risk, 5 to 20%. Now, if the 10-year estimated risk is below 5%, you can see here the recommendation is weaker, C-level, still from relatively high-quality randomized control trial evidence, but a much weaker recommendation. If you look at the language, it does say the panel favors at least moderate intensity statin for individuals with estimated risk below 5%. So I think that's interesting. Weaker recommendation, but the panel favors at least moderate intensity statin. They do highlight though, that one should consider HIV related factors that may increase the likelihood of cardiovascular events. And we'll come back and talk about that. So that's really the, the key points of this new guidelines update. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the nuances. These are the moderate intensity statins listed by the guidelines to consider and they do have a section that states that for individuals aged less than 40 there really is insufficient data for a recommendation that's largely because individuals under age 40 were not included in the reprieve trial there may be instances for people under 40 with very high ldls strong family histories familial hyperlipidemia, there, there certainly may be cases where people benefit from statins, but there's not enough data for an across the board recommendation. So much more case by case in that scenario. This is a summary, a recreation of a table from the guidelines of the results of the reprieve trial. We won't review all the details of reprieve. We've talked about it before. We have a podcast episode on the national HIV curriculum specifically talking about the trial. 
But I just want to summarize this as evidence of why the panel made the recommendation they did. So here you can see the estimated 10-year ASCVD risk score category, the number of participants in the trial. Remember, this was a trial of individuals with low to estimated ASCVD risk who were randomized to pitavastatin versus placebo. And this is the number needed to treat over five years to prevent one major adverse cardiovascular event. I believe the reason they chose number needed to treat over five years is the trial was stopped early after a median follow-up of about five years. That's my presumption of why they chose number needed to treat over this time course. But I want to point out, you can see here a clear distinction with a much lower number needed to treat for those with 10-year estimated risk 5% or greater as compared to those with under 5% estimated 10-year risk. There clearly is a difference here. Hence, I think the different strengths of the recommendation from the panel. The absolute benefit of a statin for individuals with less than 5% estimated 10-year risk will be lower because the absolute benefit really depends on the absolute risk. These numbers were updated in a recent letter to the New England Journal. I left this as the numbers uh, included in the guidelines and from the original publication. I did look at the updated numbers in the letter and they weren't too different. So, uh, you know, I think this is pretty accurate in terms of results of the trial. So that's the results the panel were going on. You saw the way the panel interpreted and their recommendations. Coming back to the individuals with estimated 10-year risk below 5%, I think interestingly, the panel calls out that we as clinicians, as HIV care providers, should be considering HIV-related factors that may increase ASCVD risk. They highlight these as being, for example, prolonged duration of HIV, delayed antiretroviral therapy initiation, long periods of viremia, or not taking medications as prescribed, low current or nadir CD4 T cell count, exposure to older antiretroviral drugs associated with cardiometabolic toxicity or co-infection with hep C. They, they call these out because these all have been associated with higher likelihood of cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular events. So these are important considerations. If someone is on the fence about starting a statin, I recorded a podcast episode with Dr. Longenecker, who you've all gotten to know through ECHO, our local HIV cardiology expert, and he, he brought up the point that what this doesn't mention is other cardiac risk factors that aren't included in the calculators, like family history, coronary calcium, lipoprotein little a. So those also might be factors to consider if someone's on the fence or their risk is on the fence. Another point Dr. Longenecker brought up that has stuck with me is this is all based on 10-year risk, but the calculators do also offer lifetime risk or 30-year risk, depending on which calculator you're using. And that's also important to consider. He gave the analogy that you might be seeing, for example, a 70-year-old person born female without a lot of other comorbidities with reasonable lipid levels, taking their medications, and estimated risk might be 5% over 10 years, but lifetime risk may not be nearly as high as for someone who's in their 40s, born male with some comorbidities, who also might have a 10-year 5% estimated risk, but a much higher lifetime risk or 30-year risk. So I think those are some other things the guidelines don't call out that I thought were really important to consider, and we'll come back to those at the end. As a reminder, those recommendations for individuals age 40 to 75 with low to intermediate risk say start at least a moderate dose statin. There may be indications for a high intensity statin, and these are some of the indications that apply both to people with HIV and people without HIV. If someone has above a 20% 10-year estimated risk, if they have an LDL above 190, or if they have diabetes. These are the examples of high intensity, moderate intensity, and low intensity statins called out by this guidelines update. Uh, the three that they emphasize are bolded here. I will just say I have not written a prescription for patavastatin. I understand it may come off patent sometime soon. I, 
do think it's certainly reasonable to use. I have not. It is the one studied in the reprieve trial, but really the prescriptions I write are primarily for atorvastatin or rosuvastatin. I did see someone the other day where I was refilling their pravastatin because they just didn't tolerate atorvastatin and they felt like they could tolerate prava better, but really most of my prescriptions are for atorvastatin or rosuvastatin. Another question that comes up is should we be monitoring lipids regularly? Should we, we be treating to targets? I'll again channel Dr. Longenecker. He mentioned that it's probably worth checking after starting and then at least yearly, both as an assessment of whether a person's taking their medication as prescribed and to see if the LDL is being lowered by the amount expected. And if not, one could consider increasing the dose and the intensity of the statin. I thought that was a good point for consideration as well. I won't go through all of this, but a reminder that there are important drug-drug interactions to consider. These are some that are emphasized by the guidelines. I will just underscore that thinking about cobacistat and ritonavir as pharmacokinetic boosters is always important. Thinking about some of the older NNRTIs might be relevant. You know, for example, earlier this week, I saw someone who really needs, based on resistance, boosted darunavir, and we were agreed to start a statin. And so I, I, I started with 10 of atorvastatin as the equivalent of a moderate intensity, whereas otherwise, for someone not taking a booster, I might have started with 20. So just an example, some considerations for the pharmacy experts on the call. If you have other input and advice, certainly appreciate that too. Finally, about the risk estimator tools, and then we'll come back to the case at the beginning. And then again, I'd love to hear your input. I'm curious to ask what tools you are using. These are two I've been using in my practice. The ACC ASCBD Risk Estimator Plus is the one I was, was using, and then I've started to integrate this new one. I'm curious to hear if any of you have switched over to using this prevent calculator yet or, or how how you are using these or others. The Risk Estimator Plus offers an estimate of 10-year risk or lifetime risk. It also, I've noticed, offers some advice, an estimate of optimized risk, and, and then they can show you the effect of therapy, like they can show you the effect of adding a statin. However, I do think a limitation I've noticed recently, they won't do that if the estimated risk is below 5%. If you end up with below 5% and try to put, look at the effect of therapy, it comes up with, well, a statin isn't recommended with risk below 5%, which is not the case that we are considering. So that is a limitation of that tool. And then the prevent calculator is the newest, and I think offers a lot of advantages. And I'm starting to integrate this into my practice and compare both. What's new, there's no race coefficient in this Calculator, which I think is important. We know that race is a social and not a biological construct. The age range starts at 30, and they have options for including a lot of relevant other factors like A1C, GFR, albuminuria, as well as zip code uh, as an assessment of, uh, they use the social deprivation index, an assessment of social determinants of health. Remember that where people live does affect their stress level, their access to care, their health outcomes, their cardiovascular disease risks. So you can put in zip code, you can also put in BMI. And then in addition to an overall estimate of risk of any cardiovascular disease, ASCVD, there's also an estimate of heart failure risk. So again, curious to know what tools you're using, curious to know if you're integrating that one or using others, please educate me about what you're using. So coming back to the case I started with, so again, this was a 50 year old patient well-controlled HIV on the regimen you can see here, not a lot of comorbidities, no other meds. The estimated risk was below 5%. So I did dig back and think about some of the HIV-related risk factors. You can see those here. And I did plug all of the relevant parameters into both of those tools and just showed these to the patient and, and, and talked about some of the pros and cons and what we know and what's in the new guidelines. The risk estimator plus gave a 10-year estimated risk of 3.7%, as I showed you before, the lifetime risk 36%, whereas prevent gave a 10-year estimated risk of 1.5% and a 30-year estimated risk of 10%. I'm finding that for a lot of my patients, the prevent calculator does give an overall lower estimate of risk. 
I try to look for some data comparing them. I don't know if that's always consistent, but that's my anecdotal observation. But really what I did is I just showed this patient all of these numbers, talked about what we know and don't know, talked about the guidelines. This patient said, well, you know, my long-term risk is pretty elevated. I don't mind taking another pill a day. I would like to do everything I can to reduce the risk of heart attack or stroke. So I like to take a statin and we ended up starting. Again, curious if you would do anything differently. I think that's in line with the guidelines. If this individual had said, look, I really don't want another pill. I really don't want to start yet. You know, I would have waited, rechecked every year, brought up the conversation again every year, touched base, um, you know, assess their personal preference, their goals, and just, you know, kind of talk more about it and, and, and touch base about it regularly. The other thing that I looked at is just how long until their, their risk might be 5%. And if instead of 50, I put in age 53, just in three years, their risk would increase to above 5%. And that sort of convinced them as well. So this person was eager, willing to take another pill, wanted to do everything they could. Easy decision to start a statin. If they had said, I'm not ready yet, I think that also would have been a reasonable decision and I would have followed up about it regularly. So what I take from these guidelines, we need to be talking about statins more, we need to be considering it, we need to be having the conversations. For people with estimated risk below 5%, I don't interpret the guidelines to say, everyone absolutely needs a statin. I do interpret it to mean we should be thinking about statins, talking about statins, considering HIV history and non-HIV related risk factors, considering long-term and lifetime risk, and just talking about personal preference and making the decision together. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.